Hello, travelers. Welcome to Reach the World's Explorer program. For over 20 years, Reach the World has inspired youth to become curious, confident, and compassionate global citizens through virtual exchange. My name is Tim, and I'm so glad you're joining us for today's live stream event. Today, we're very lucky to be chatting with Explorer, TV host, and former president of the Explorers Club, Richard Weiss. Amongst his many adventures, Richard participated in a medical research expedition to Mount Everest. And today we're gonna to talk a lot more about why people seem to be drawn to this highest place on earth. This is the kickoff live stream event for Reach the World's Expedition to Everest virtual exchange. If you are a K through 12 educator who would like to follow this entire virtual exchange live with your students, I'll add the free registration link below in just a moment. Uh, but without further ado, we've got Richard waiting in the wings and we're ready to travel virtually to the Himalayas. So let me bring in Richard. Hey, Richard. Hi, Tim. How are you? I'm, I'm great. I'd like to say I'm in the Himalayas, but I'm actually at home in Connecticut. So uh, it's nice and warm in here. And, uh, you know, I've got walls around me and I can breathe pretty easy. Fantastic. Well, it's great to be able to talk to you today. I'm excited to have you as our, our guest today because you have been to... Uh, Mount Everest. You have not summited, I know, but you just being on the, the mountain and being around the mountain has so much uh, interest and intrigue, especially for young kids who know it as the highest place on earth, but maybe don't know what it's like to be there. So I thought maybe we could start by you giving us a little bit more information about who you are and what brought you to Everest. Well, you know, going to Mount Everest is really a culmination of a lot of things that happen in my life. And I had um, something that at the time didn't seem like a big deal when I was 11 years old. My father, who was an airline pilot, took me to climb Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa. In fact, there's a picture of Mount Kilimanjaro uh, over here. Um, I just came back from um, a 50th anniversary of my first climb. And that sort of got my interest going on mountaineering. And I remember uh, growing up on Long Island, which is not a very mountainous place in New York, that I would study these maps wherever I went to see where was the high point. I really sort of got interested in maps and the idea of going to high places. And so um, fast forward many years later, I was asked to participate in a medical study by emergency room doctors on Mount Everest. They were... Um, doing some really interesting work. Uh, a lot of you probably don't realize that when most people go to the emergency room, most or quite a few deaths are caused from hypoxia, and that means lack of oxygen in your blood. You might've heard about that during the COVID period. And so they don't really know why some people are more susceptible to this medical uh, problem than others. You can't look at somebody, Tim, I can't look at you or uh, you know, my mother, your daughter, whatever, and say, oh, you'd be good at altitude or in low oxygen situations. In fact, I was just on Mount Kilimanjaro uh, just a few weeks ago, and there was one young climber who's 15 who had to go down his blood oxygen, that, that pulse oximeter during COVID that you might have seen, and his readings went, you know, into the mid 50s. Mm. And that's a, a pretty, you know, dangerous level he was evacuated to lower elevation and he recovered. So fast forward, a lot of things were going on. It was the 10th anniversary of a famous accident that occurred on Mount Everest. It was called the into thin air accident. And it was um, a period of time where several climbers and guides got trapped um, well above their capabilities to handle a storm. There was one famous moment within it where uh, this guy, Rob Hall, was a mountain guide from New Zealand, was trapped at 28,000 feet, which is well into what they call the death zone, where your body can, uh, can't really sustain itself for very long without passing away. And I remember during the book and during the movie, there was a very personal um, portion of it where they uh, patched him into his wife in New Zealand. She was pregnant with their daughter, seven months pregnant. And, um, you know, in his dying words, he was gasping. She knew he was dying, that they decided what they call the daughter. But it really brought to light, you know, some of the hardships and dangers of going into high altitude. It's, it seems very her heroic, 
but most people who do it, you, you don't actually have fun while you're in those situations. It's one of those things when you finish, there's that level of satisfaction, but you know, people do summit and people still die there. Um, we've, we've started right away with the dangers of, of being that high above sea level. Um, can you remind us, Richard, approximately how high Mount Everest is? How, how tall are we talking? How can we put that into perspective? Yeah, we don't so the, tall. well, there's a couple of ways we can put it in perspective. It's 29,000 feet with a little uh, more to it. When you fly an airplane across the country, you're probably going 30,000 feet. So you're right around the top, uh, height of Mount Everest at um, 18,000 feet, which is almost the height of Kilimanjaro, which you see in that picture, there's half the oxygen of sea level. Mm -hmm. And so um, your body is able to acclimatize to that after a certain period. But on Mount Everest, uh, there's a certain height where your body can not acclimatize. They call it the death zone. Mm -hmm. And it's at approximately 23,000 feet. Um, so just to put the perspective of Empire State Building, now you're stacking about, you know, 28 Empire State Buildings on top of each other. So the uh, temperatures, uh, meteorology plays a big factor in this. For about every thousand feet you go up, the temperature goes down about three and a half degrees. It's called the adiabatic lapse rate. And so the temperatures are, you know, just brutally cold on the mountain um, in the evenings. Um, people have to wear very dark glasses because at that altitude, you could burn your eyes. Um, the winds are often pretty great. And uh, a friend of mine who I ran into while I was on Everest, who climbed it, said that what happens at altitude is you become incredibly stupid. He said that he had gotten to his tent at 26,000 feet and he started to cry because he couldn't remember how to untie his boots. And, you know, this is something that, um, that when things are going well, inexperienced people can, you know, attempt and uh, be successful. But what happens is that uh, when people lack a certain apprenticeship of skills, especially when they're not at optimum thinking, it becomes very difficult. Like, well, you guys probably don't tie your shoelaces because I have 12 year old boys and I know that they're used to Velcro and, and sort of do these knots, but I've tied my shoes so many times I could be half asleep and still do it. So that's something because of the apprenticeship of that skill I could do. If I were teaching someone to tie their shoelaces at high altitude, it'd just be too confusing. That is wild that the things that we remember and take for granted as skills we can all do just become harder and harder and harder with altitude. I want to say a special hello to Mr. Lee's third grade class in California for joining us today. If you have questions along the way for Richard, please feel free to uh, drop them in the chat. I'll be sure to loop them into our conversation. But I wanted to, Richard, go back to sort of the journey that it takes just to get to Mount Everest. Say if you're coming from outside of Nepal, and you would like to make it to just the base of Mount Everest, what is that experience like? What is that journey like? Well, for me, my airport of choice going overseas is New York, not because they're great airports. It's the most convenient to where I live in Connecticut. You fly into India, then you fly into Kathmandu, which you know is a relatively major city, though culturally it's you know very different uh, than America. Um, and then you fly to this little airport, uh, or little, uh, it's not even an airport. It's a landing strip called Lukla and it's high up in the mountains. And, uh, it's almost more interesting. Um, and it's a super short runway. When you take off from that airport, you go down the runway and you're going off a cliff and then you sort of drop down off of that cliff. And then eventually the plane starts flying. So. You know, to start, uh, especially when you're coming back from Everest, to go off a runway where you know you're going to go off a cliff and then hope that the engines work and then you go up uh, is a little scary. But you fly into Lukla, which I think is is about, um, I want to say 12,000 feet high, about the height of the Rockies. And then um, you go through the most interesting uh, place called Namchi Bazaar. And this is a few days walk uh, from that airport, but 
it's in, in the term bizarre, they're selling all sorts of stuff that came out of China. Like if you want to buy a backpack, hiking boots, all these sort of factory samples make it over there, or, or uh, maybe people sell new equipment after they come back from Everest. So it's, even though um, it, it's, it's capitalist an area that you'll find. And then as you walk, they use, uh, because the terrain is too rough, you use yaks to carry uh, gear. And so you see all these big horns and these furry kind of almost prehistoric creatures carrying things. Um, you know, the locals now are dressing, you know, more modern. You'll see them wearing Nike shirts. Uh, the forests are made of rhododendrons and they have these beautiful flowers. Uh, and you see all sorts of uh, Buddhist shrines there. Uh, when I was there, uh, they did have a problem, what they call Maoist insurgents. And these Maoist insurgents uh, were like road robbers. They would actually hold people up and ask them for money. And they'd actually give you a stamp that you paid this sort of bribe. So the next person who tried to rob you wouldn't rob you. And then, you know, obviously uh, on the trail to, to Everest, which takes many days, uh, you know, the veg vegetation becomes less and less, becomes drier. Um, people sometimes have breathing problems. And you have all these wonderful tea houses where you stop and they have fires going, uh, which they use yak dung uh, as their fuel. Uh, you have teas. And then eventually you get up to uh, Everest Base Camp, which is at about 17,000 feet. Uh, I, I remember I went, I think it was end of March, beginning of April. I remember the first night there being something like minus 40 degrees. It was, you know, horribly cold, but uh, you're wearing gear that is, uh, you know, the, the jackets are just huge on you. So much down and, you know, you're covered. And if you're dressed right, you get through it. But you also acclimatize the temperatures and sleeping conditions. All right. Um, I want to give a special welcome to Miss Long's third grade class in Boulder, Colorado. It's so great to see classrooms tuning in live. Uh, we have a question from Miss Long's class that I want to get to, and I'll okay. put my questions a little further down the road because they had a great question. Why would you not get altitude sickness on an airplane if you're flying at the same height as this death zone at the top of Mount Everest? I know the answer of this. My father was a pilot. And so they pressurize airplanes. So when you fly at 30,000 feet, they generally pressurize it from anywhere to 4,000 feet to about 6,000 feet. So if you're coming from Colorado, that's pretty much the altitude you're coming from. I think sometimes people who are a little sensitive to altitude will find they don't sleep as well on an airplane because the air is super dry. And also you are at a little bit of altitude. Um, but, and that's about the highest point on the East Coast, Mount Washington and Mount Mitchell are the two highest points on the East Coast. Great, yeah, thank you for the question, Ms. Long's class. Keep them coming in the chat, I'll loop them in as, as they come. Um, Richard, so how long does it take you to get from the last place you can fly to, which I think you said was Lukla Airport, and I would encourage anybody who's watching to Google Lukla and take a, uh, just see a picture of this airport because it's very unique. Um, how long does it take to get from Lukla to the, just the base of Mount Everest? Where yeah, I, th I think it's about a 10 day walk. And, um, you know, it's important to, you know, not shortcut that because your body is able to get used to altitude as you go up and, you know, walking slowly, drink plenty of water, um, avoiding, you know, certain things like people can't drink al alcohol at that or take sleeping pills. And uh, they actually do take a certain type of medication that helps you accumulate. It's, it's a di diuretic, which is similar to like coffee. Um, makes you have to pee a lot in the middle of the night. But, uh, you know, that's something that you have to take when you're going to altitude. All right. Um, so you did this 10-day this hike uh, from Lukla to Everest Base Camp. Right. And Everest Base Camp, can you describe what Everest Base Camp is? Well, it's interesting. The, I mean, virtually the moment I got to base camp, all of a sudden I hear this thunderous noise and I look up the mountains and I happen to have a camera around my neck and there was a big avalanche coming down the mountain. That's the very first impression. 
I got a base camp. And luckily the avalanche stopped short of, of camp. And then there's, you know, different sort of like tent cities around there. All these people from around the world um, are either coming or going from the summit or on top of further up on the mountain. Uh, there's certain types of entrepreneurs who, uh, I remember there was a pop-up bakery there. Somebody was selling bread for about like $20 a loaf, just because when you're just so used to eating camp food, fresh loaf of bread is something that would be really special. And uh, some of the bigger tents are insulated and might have heating, a lot of equipment there from people medical to filming. Um, you know, some people who can afford it will bring some of the uh, more luxurious things from home, like cappuccino machines. I mean, you do anything you, you can because often you'll be stuck there for about a month till the weather opens up. And the um, weather reports they get now are so much more advanced than in the time of uh, when Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay climbed it in 1953. In fact, that is Ed Hillary's ice axe from that era right above my mantle there. And uh, so, you know, now uh, you may have heard that there's all these uh, big crowds of people trying to summit on the day. It's because weather reports have become so accurate that they know when the window of weather is going to be good. So everybody tries to go to the summit at the same time. And even that process uh, takes a while. Um, a Sherpa, a person who is native to that region of the Himalayas because of evolution and they they were born many generations at altitude, are able to um, uh, exist at that altitude a lot more effectively than Westerners like myself. So they've had people who've actually gone from the base camp to the summit in, in a day, whereas it might take somebody else, you know, a week or two. So that's wow. a pretty incredible adaptation that people of that region of the world have made to altitude. Yeah, you so you were you went to Everest to help gather research and data on yep. the impact of this altitude on humans. Yep. Uh, we have a great another great question from Miss Long's class in the chat. Um, that I think may directly relate to the data you were trying to collect. They're asking, what are some strategies that climbers use to get through that death zone and make it to the top? Like, how do you, what are some tricks that people- That is a great question. And I do have a trick. And this trick actually came into play during COVID and a recent hiking thing. So there is a type of breathing that you do on mountains that's called pressure breathing. I'll breathe through my nose and blow out like that. It may not seem that significant, but it's the same breathing that people who try to hold their breath for a long time uh, do when they go underwater. And you can try this breathing. Um, I recently had uh, a very famous music, a ma magician, David Blaine, who's also a guy who's held his breath for a long time, teach me how to hold my breath for four minutes. So how does this all relate to high altitude? So one of the things that you do when you climb is you're constantly monitoring your own health. And you've seen those uh, little machines that you put your finger in. It's called a pulse oximeter, and it measures what percentage of oxygen is in your blood. And obviously you want that to be as high as possible. So I found out that when I was on Kilimanjaro, routinely that would go into the 80s, 80%, like 85%. And I did this power breathing and and if any of you have the ability to try this at home, it will work. What I would do is I'd take a big, deep breath down into my uh, gut and then go. And I would notice that my percentage of oxygen in my blood would increase. So I thought to myself when I first learned that on Everest, that if I ever got COVID and were in a situation where my blood oxygen was low, that I would employ that type of breathing to uh, get that back up. So that that would be a little trick of the trade that I sort of, you know, really connected all the dots on and re realize it's not only great for learning how to hold your breath really long, but it's also good at getting more oxygen into your blood at high altitude. Excellent. Is it is it fair to say that as soon as you come down out of the death zone, 
lot of those risks go away too. Like there, yeah. there's a strategy of not spending too much time where it's so hard on your body. Yeah. So, you know, again, I have more experience on other mountains, but it's, you know, you, you, people typically get these headaches in the side of their head and that's called pulmonary edema, which is a fancy way for saying that your brain is actually swelling and hitting the sides of your head. And, um, you know, especially at Colorado, when people go to the uh, 14,000 foot peaks, they get those kind of headaches. And so as soon as you start going down from altitude, it almost immediately goes away. So the best sort of cure for high altitude is to get to low altitude. All right, great. We have talked a little bit today about all of the dangers and the risks and the hardships that it takes to even just get to the base of Mount Everest, much less get to the top of Mount Everest. Why do people do this, Richard? What is it that draws people to this mountain? I, you know, I love seeing extremes. And I remember when I was a kid growing up on Long Island, whenever there was a hurricane offshore, my father and I would go to the ocean just to see the massive waves. Or as a kid, I remember even now when there's a big snowstorm, it's just fun to go out into this extreme environment. And I think that so many explorers I know, uh, they don't necessarily have a death wish. They really want to see the world. You want to see different environments. Uh, and there's so many great, I always say the best reality show is really going out out into the elements. And whether you're going out on a lake or going on a mountain, I think there's always been people, since people came out of caves or trees, who always wanted to know what's on the other side of something, what's down there to experience these different environments. And I, I think that uh, a quote that has always stayed with me, um, I think Thoreau may have said, you're the sum and total of your experiences. and as individuals, I always say the best that you can do in life is to keep evolving. And I think the more experiences that you have, uh, the more that languages that you hear, the more sights that you see are outside of your town, all becomes a sum in total of who you are. It makes you more interesting, makes you smarter, more worldly, all of those things. And I think that even as I get older, there's almost more things that I want to see. It becomes kind of like a an addiction to uh, seeing things. So, and it's also like when I was younger, you always wanted to test yourself to see, you know, whether it was how long can I hold my breath to how high can I go, how fast, all of those things. I think those are, you know, things that you can all probably uh, relate to to some degree. Yeah, absolutely. I have put on the bottom, uh, scrolling a link to the virtual exchange homepage where we have published Richard's first article where he goes into some of the things he's talking about today in a little more depth. It includes some of his photos from his expedition to Everest, including some really amazing photos of the avalanche that he described earlier in our call. It shows a base camp. It shows the tea house on the route from Lukla to the base camp. Um, so make sure that you visit the homepage, you read Richard's article if you haven't already. Uh, we have two more questions, Richard, uh, for you from Colorado. Wow. Uh, People from Colorado are imbued with curiosity. I love it. I think maybe they have some experience too, because these are very uh, insightful questions about altitude. What tools sure. and training did you use to help or would you use if there was an avalanche or even maybe more broadly, what training and tools did you have to do or did you bring with you to prepare for the possibility of an avalanche on Everest? So, you know, the first thing with any kind of given disaster is that uh, you try to avoid it. So I always say the metaphor I always use or the analogy is that if I'm in a sailboat and I see dark cl clouds on the horizon, I'm not going to test my skills of how to survive that. I'm going to try to avoid it. Uh, you might, you know, if you're reading the news right now about the hurricane down in Florida, you don't want to test how you can prevent drowning. You're told this information, you avoid it. So when you're experienced or as you gain experience or you go with experienced people, you do your best to stay out of potentially dangerous situations. Now, that being said, things always happen. And I'd say the best piece of advice, 
and I got this from my father. He was a pilot and he always seemed super calm is whenever uh, an accident or something's happening, I try to slow things down. I try to put myself in a bubble of calm because instead of going, oh my God, oh my God. And I, I can relate this to a near drowning experience I had in a canoe race where I was sucked under some logs. And I thought to myself, I clearly remember you have a minute or so, you know, try to find the light. So I think in avalanche is that whole idea of trying to you know up from down or even creating kind of a um, some space between your face so you don't suffocate and it would be super important, you know. So, I mean, everything's a little uh, specific to the actual thing, but those are things that I've often thought if I was ever covered in avalanche, I'd want to create some sort of uh, bubble around my face so at least I had some breathing time. All right. And you talked a little bit earlier about um, the way that being up in higher altitudes exposes you to less oxygen, thinner air. Um, maybe as part of your study, um, that was a, a central part. When this final question from Colorado is, how many people use oxygen when climbing? Is, uh, is added oxygen or supplementary oxygen in tanks uh, something that helps with that issue? Yeah, so I've never used supplemental oxygen. And what supplemental oxygen does is it effectively brings, it's sort of like being in the airplane where you're at a certain altitude. You know, I um, the problem with relying on technology is it works really well until it doesn't. And some people have had problems with supplemental oxygen. So if you're not acclimatized, and you've relied on the supplemental oxygen and you have a tube that breaks or ice is over, then, you know, you have problems. And so that's why I, I keep going back to people should learn uh, the skills instead of relying always on technology. Technology is great. I'm a big advocate of technology, but I also like to know how to do things old school. That's great. And as we're going to talk about later in this virtual exchange, having oxygen tanks on the mountain presents some other challenges and, and issues, uh, especially when you've got these big tanks that you're then done with and you don't want to carry anymore. Well, that's and the other thing is people become, and I've seen this on a lot of things because you're so, in some situations, you're so unable to take care of yourself that people will, um, just leave stuff where they are just because they don't have the energy or the consciousness of thought to do it better. And that's a problem. And I think that, um, you know, I always maintain that you have to be as good a global citizen, especially when traveling to someone else's land to sort of leave it as you found it. Yeah. Hey, Tim, yeah. I have a really good geography, um, quiz question I want to throw to the audience. Please, yes, go ahead. So everybody knows that Mount Kilimanjaro is 29,000 feet above sea level, but we also know that the earth is not perfectly round. So if you were to take a string from the center of the earth, where would the highest point of land be? Where would that string be the longest? Uh, fascinating question. You said Mount Kilimanjaro, but I think you mean Mount Everest. Um, well, Ever I'm sorry, Everest is 29,000 feet. True, yep. but it's not, if you took that string, because again, the earth is not perfectly round, it's wider on the equator, where would be this, the highest point in that string? And I'll give you a hint, and then you guys can look it up. It's in the country of Ecuador, which is on the equator. All right, that is a great parting geography challenge for our classrooms that are joining us and the classrooms that will be watching this recording afterwards. So. Thank you so much, Richard. Any further parting words about the allure of, of Everest and why people go through all of this uh, to, to go and experience this place that has great risks? I will give you a promise. You may not be able to go to Everest, but there's always an adventure you can have no matter where you are. And the whole idea is like even the other night, I knew that Jupiter was going to be at its closest point to the Earth. I went out there with my kids. I wanted to see it. And I felt, you know, I could have stayed and continued to watch the Yankee game, but I went outside, I looked up, took some pictures with my iPhone, and somehow I felt better about my place in the universe. So get out there and look at things. 
Colorado is a great state to explore, but I, I say virtually any state or any hometown has something that you do not know about. All right, Richard, thank you so much for our classrooms and, and teachers who were able to join us today. Thank you so much for your great questions. I uh, love hearing what you're interested in. This is just the beginning of our expedition to Everest virtual exchange. I have added a link at the bottom of your screen. If you are ready to follow the whole virtual exchange expedition, you can find more information and a registration link there. Uh, Richard, thank you again so much for joining us today. Over the next few weeks, we're going to talk to scientists, more explorers, filmmakers, members of the Sherpa community, and get a really wide range of perspectives on Mount Everest. And I think we're going to learn a lot about this unique place on the Earth in the process. We're also going to even travel virtually to the Royal Geographical Society in London to see their new exhibition about filmmaking on Mount Everest uh, around some really famous expeditions in the 1920s. So this is just the beginning. There's so much more to come. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And until next time, take care. Thank you.